Welcome to our School of the Bible. Here at School of the Bible, we like to take short encapsulated portions of the scripture and in 15 verses take 15 minutes to explain, to possibly inspire, to be inspired, to allow for the Holy Spirit who is God, who is the third part of the Father, Son, and Spirit of God that we know is the Godhead, that is God, to give us the ability to understand what it is that God would be speaking to each and every one of us right now, right here, even within your hearing. And so before we get started, I don't, you know, pray because actually one of the things that people don't realize is that when Jesus said, go into your closet and pray in secret to your heavenly father and he will reward you openly he wasn't kidding he really meant don't pray in public he didn't mean just like the scribes and the pharisees because you know if you pray in public you're not praying for whatever you're praying because it's a tradition it's a habit it's something you do to be seen we don't when jesus says something we take it literal there's a good reason. If Jesus was saying it, would I be sitting here thinking, well, God, are you doing this as an allegory or a metaphor, or what are you doing? No, I'd be listening. As such, we study the Bible by way of what we call integral specificity. Now, you can look that up at Google, and integral specificity is that study of the DNA structure that has the actual ribonucleic acids and the integers that are specific to their location and their instructions that are encoded upon that ribonucleic acid helix structure that causes life to exist. And we say it that way because the revelation of life is what the integral specificity is. And in the same way, that's how we examine the Bible, by integral specificity. Life comes forth out of the words themselves when it is the Spirit of God that is giving us that ability to understand what is written here. Because the same Spirit that inspired the writers inspires us. So that gives us the ability to hear and have specifically codified to us that which God wants to speak to us. So in medieval church we have the expression that says, the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the people of God of the Son of God Jesus. Because that sums up all that the Holy Spirit does for us if we are born again and if we are receiving the things of the Spirit as God has given them to us, not only in the Bible, but also by way of His very nature, the Spirit of God, revealing to us His words. So it's not just a book that's written with just codified words here that are just nice to look at, you know, and read and understand that they are, you know, beneficial to us because they're historical or they're allegorical or they're legal or they're in some ways helpful, but rather they become, as God's Spirit applies them, the Word of God. So we're looking in, as we use that code, 15 minutes for 15 verses, we're looking in, I believe, First Kings, like, Okay, when you're talking, can you look up your Bible? Well, in my big Bible, no. In my little Bible, yes. But uh, we've gone through Samuel's and blah, 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 blah. You know, so we're here at what is sometimes called the third book of Kings, but we're calling it First Kings, as it is in the King James. And um, we would call this First Kings 1515, because, again, it's 15 verses in 15 minutes. You're spared a lot of time because... We're just trying to get a little bit in that you could be inspired with for your day and your way of understanding what God has to say to you. So in reading 1 Kings, Now King David was old and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he got no heat. Wherefore his servant said unto him, Let there be sought for my Lord, the king a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and let her cherish him, and let her lie in thy bosom, and that my lord the king may get heat. 
So they sought for a fair damsel throughout all the coasts of Israel and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. And the damsel was very fair and cherished the king and ministered to him, but the king knew her not. Then Adonijah, the son of Hadith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why have you done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bore him Absalom. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, with Abiathar, the priest, and they, following Adonijah, helped him. But Zadok, the priest, and Benaniah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan, the prophet, and Shmai, and Rai, and the mighty men which belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, which is at Enrogel, and called all his brethren, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, and the king's servants. But Nathan the prophet, and Benaniah, and the mighty men, and Solomon his brother, he called not. Wherefore Nathan spoke unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign, and David our son, or David our Lord, knoweth not? Now therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give you counsel, that you may save your own life and the life of your son, Solomon. Go and get you unto King David, and say unto him, Didn't you know, my lord, O king? Swear unto thy handmaiden, saying, Surely Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. Why then doth Adonijah reign? Behold, while thou talkest there with the king, I am also will come in after thee, and confirm thy words. And Bathsheba went in unto the king, into the chamber, and the king was very old. And Abishag the Shunammite ministered unto the king. Now this is interesting politically. It's not far-fetched from what we're having occurring in our own government today. We have people that are giving counsel one way or another to the president. Oftentimes, a king will be too old to reign, and that point in time, different people will try to take over the kingdom. They will try to place themselves in charge when the ruler no longer has the faculties to control his own empire or kingdom. You've seen this sometimes in business or in areas of your own life when your parents have become too old to offer you advice. Sometimes you find that there are situations and circumstances in business where you know that the person is gone off the deep end, so to speak. They're no longer mentally capable to keep up with the business. And sometimes that's where we have boardrooms and CEOs when they have stock involved. Because then they're able to advise or to cause someone to step down from the office that they're in when they no longer have the capabilities of dealing with the office. And that's what's happened with the prophet. See, the prophet is older than David, and yet he still has his faculties. David apparently is more interested in his women than he is with his Lord. And we know that that's happened at different times in his life, so it's happened in his old age. He has a slave woman now to keep him warm, which Make no mistake about the descriptions here. She's not just sleeping in the bed to keep it warm because beds, you know, they have a covering, but at nighttime it gets cold, obviously, either in a house or in a stone building or in a tent or in the desert. Well, she's obviously, as we're seeing in verse 1 and 2, you know, says stand before him and to keep him warm and to obviously be attractive to keep David's heart beating, so to speak. Now, we may joke about it, we may laugh about it, but it works, really. When a man lusts, his face is flushed. He gets more of a whatever interest. I happen to have worked for an old, wealthy, rich man who kept telling me to go out and find him porno. Well, I kept telling his people to go find him porno, but that's what he did because it kept him exercising his ability even though he had a wife. All I can say is that riches and power and things like that corrupt and 
the more money you got, the more power you have, the more corruption you'll see. We find here in David's kingdom, there is corruption. It's obviously falling apart. It's obviously going to pieces. We're seeing things fracturing and completely coming apart. Even as we see, like in America now, we have hate groups that are growing by the minute. We have presidents that are claiming and making false statements against news agencies, against people, against his own family, against his own neighbors, against even the ones that have elected him. And anyone and everyone except for himself, he's blaming. Not unlike what's happened with David. David, who was supposed to be the man of God, no one ever, I mean, people pray they would be like David, but I always look at David's life and I say, you know, by the end of his life, he didn't look so good. You know, I don't want to be like David. I'd rather be like Jesus. So we need to examine ourselves sometimes to see who our heroes are, because they may not be as all they look like they ought to be. David, as a young man, may have seemed and appeared to be someone you might want to be. Oh, he slew the giant, you know. But that led to other things that were wrong also. And even in David's own Psalms, he cries out to God, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Because David knew he was a sinner, just like you, just like me. You see, there is a problem that each and every one of us have. And that is we have to own up to what we are. The prophet is going to get together with Bathsheba in order to remind David of who he is what he is and where he came from. And sometimes as a Christian, I find myself having to preach to people who know better, who act better, and I deny what I'm saying to them. Because they don't want to admit that Donald Trump is not a Christian, or they don't want to admit that they've gotten into politics rather than gospel. They don't want to admit that it's easier to go after, you know, abortion clinics than it is to save people that are abortion doctors, or save people from their sins. Well, we want to keep our own little group or our mega group. Hey, now that I've arrived, you know, I built my church up. Hey, I'm here now. Now I can do what I want. Mark Driscoll is a perfect example of that. Hey, he got enough power, he thought he could get away with it. And he wound up being taken down by his own people and God setting him down. Now he's gotten back up and he's building himself back up and he's still in ministry. Getting pretty big from what I understand. But... The issue we have in reading Kings is that we're going to find that the kings aren't necessarily godly or aren't necessarily holy. They are just simply men in positions of power that have to be reminded by men who are in relationship with God that they are failing. You don't see this guy come up and rubber stamp David and say, hey David, right on, good job, let's do this. No, he goes by way of virtue of God telling him to, to grab Bathsheba and pull a stunt. Hey, you go talk to him. And while you're talking to him, if he says, you know, that this is, you know, my son David is going to be the thing, I'll walk in and be the evidence of it. Because you're a woman. What testimony will you as Bathsheba have? After all, I mean, come on now, you know, David kind of killed off your husband, you know. So, we have to recognize David's not perfect. David's not just forgiven. David's in sin, really. Putting a, and allowing for his counselors to tell him to have an old woman or have a young woman to you know, keep him warm, he could have just as easily snuggled up to a sheep. And I don't mean to sleep with, you know, as far as what you're thinking, sleep. I mean, that's the wool. The wool would have kept him warm. But reality check is, it was sin. There's no way to define it any other way. That's not godly. That's not Ten Commandments. That's not principles of God. That's a king being kept appeased by his people where, yeah, you go tell Donald Trump that he could go have a whore, pardon the expression, and he'll go for it because he already admitted on a bus that he was cheating on his own wife at the time and he was acceptable of it. That's David accepting the sin even though it's the end of his life. Dare I say, we ought to be more like the prophet than like the king. And even in America today, we have to examine ourselves to say, look, that's not what I want to be. I don't want to be a Donald Trump, and I don't want any of my children ever to be like Donald Trump. God forbid uh, that I could ever look at that man and say, huh, yeah, let's make him an American. That's the worst example of an ugly American I've ever seen. And yet Christians are flocking to him. Why? 
Because just like we're going to see here, Adonijah sets himself up as king, as Donald is also. He thinks that he can run the government like a king. And that's what Adonijah has made the same mistake. He hasn't acknowledged that there is God overall. So let that be a word for you and for me. Let us examine ourselves in light of the situations and circumstances that are in our country and in our land and in our government and in our leaders and say, whoa, let me go back to where I came from and recognize who I was at the beginning. A man seeking God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. Not a man who has to be convinced of what God had told him to do or reminded, but a man that knows intimately what God is doing and chooses to follow through with that. So that's a lesson that you can apply to your life. It's something you can do right now. You can read the scriptures, you can study them, you can apply them, and you can make them a part of your life because they will remind you what you should do. They'll remind you what you could do. They'll tell you what you ought to do, but they're not going to stop you from doing what you do. If anything, they'll warn you, you will reap what you sow.